Hello world, we are live here at GBMC and my name is Betsy Dovek and I am the host of What's Up Dr. Dovek, in case you missed it, that's who I am. And today we're going to get to know Dr. Jennifer Sullivan. She is the Division Chief of Thoracic Surgery here at GBMC. So Dr. Sullivan, welcome to the program. I'm so happy to um, get to interview you and also get to know more about you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So let's get right to it. Um, I have a little fun fact out there. I'm not sure if a lot of you knew, but November is Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And there is a lot of hype about October. It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. But this is an important month as well, and we should not let that go unnoticed. So you treat lung cancer. And I, for those of those out there who are watching, how does a patient um, present if they have lung cancer, if they're not sure? Tell me more about this, this disease and how you can help take care of it. So uh, the important thing about lung cancer is actually it's the number one killer of cancer in men and women. So we hear a lot about breast cancer. You hear a lot about colon cancer. Um, that's because there's always been great screening tests for them. Um, and lung cancer screening, which we'll get into a little bit of blip, um, recently only just came around. So lung cancer is the number one cause of cancer deaths in America in men and women. Um, the problem with lung cancer um, and why it's so deadly is it's one of those cancers that you just don't really have symptoms um, until it's more progressed, which is why it's important to get screening. I, for me, I see patients as a surgeon uh, in the early stages of lung cancer when it's treatable by surgery. Um, the most common comment I hear from my patients is, I had no idea I had lung cancer. I feel fine. I have no problems. I happened to fall off my horse, broke a rib, and found out I had lung cancer on the CT scan. Or with the lung cancer screening, people are getting caught that way. But the number one thing I hear is, I had no idea I had symptoms. If you do, there are signs where the cancer, if it's located in a certain area, you can still have an early stage lung cancer but have symptoms. And those kind of symptoms are coughing up blood because it's irritating something in the airway or the tumor itself is tickling something in your airway, so it coughs out blood. I've seen patients that have had recurrent pneumonias. So they had a really bad pneumonia, they got treated with antibiotics, the um, pneumonia got better, but then they got sick again. And the antibiotics helped again, and then they got sick again. And it turned out there was a tumor sort of blocking a little part of their airway that kept building up secretions. Um, Otherwise, the, the kind of other symptoms you think about weight loss, fatigue, that really more is in the advanced stages of lung cancer, um, as well as pain is more associated if it's getting bigger, if it's growing into something. Um, you'll have pain if it's growing into a bone or if it's pushing on another structure. But those early stage lung cancers, they don't stimulate any nerve fibers in the lungs. You don't feel pain. Um, so that's why it's important to catch them sooner, uh, because that's when they're the most treatable. So why do you feel that, um, you talked about screening and that there's just no really great screening test. It's normally found incidentally when something else happens. Like you said, a pneumonia, they just have this cough that won't go away or um, they, they are in a trauma and they incidentally see it on a CT scan when they're looking for something else. Why don't we do CAT scans on every single person? So unfortunately, if we CAT scanned everyone, we would find, um, all kinds of things that we that are nothing that aren't cancers and then have a lot of invasive tests. And so that's been the biggest struggle with that. And of course, we have to say at the end of the day, insurance companies and cost of a CAT scan, radiation exposure to CAT scans as well. In the last decade is when lung cancer screening finally sort of started coming around. And really honestly, in the last five years is it really started taking off as people have been more aware of it. The current guidelines, um, and I'll refer to the United States Preventative Task Force. That's the most common committee that most people hear about in terms of um, insurance companies and the government and what they follow in terms of recommendations, but especially the insurance companies as well. Um, the current recommendations are if you're the age 55 to 80, because that is when we will see most lung cancers. If you have a 30 pack smoking history, so this is a little bit of math there. Um, if you smoked a pack a day for 30 years, you have a 30 pack year smoking history. If you smoke two packs a day for 15 years, you have a 30 pack year smoking history. So it's a, it, it's kind of the amount of smoking. If you smoke two packs, yeah, so I said that 15 years. Um, you have to be currently smoking or not have quit within the last, or, or not have quit within the last 15 years. So because previous studies had said if you'd quit smoking once you got out to 15 years, past 15 years, your chances of lung cancer started decreasing, though we do see people 
20 years out from quitting smoking that do show up with lung cancer, but that's the current guidelines, 55 to 80, 30 pack year smoking history, currently smoking, or if you quit, it hasn't been more than 15 years. But very excitingly coming out, I'm hoping by the end of this year, the, the task force is, is amending those recommendations. They're actually gonna decrease the pack year to 20 pack year smoking history. That is gonna open up lung cancer screening to about 2 million more people, which will catch about 3,000 more lung cancers early and, and treatable. So um, that's kind of exciting that they're coming through with that recommendation. It's hoping it comes out at the end of year, meaning it'll kick in next year in terms of being able to get insurance coverages. So you talked a little bit about um, finding it early because if it's too advanced, then even your specialty of having a surgical removal of it isn't something that's even worth it or effective. So how do you... Um, how do you stage these cancers and, and, and how do you know if it's um, an early stage versus a later one? What, what are you looking for there? So most of the um, staging is based off of the NCCN, the National Cancer uh, Comprehensive Network. And what we look at are, are three factors in staging lung cancer. The T is the size. So we say, oh, you have a, a T is tumor, you know, the size of the tumor. So obviously the smaller the tumor, the earlier the stage. Um, also where it's located at, that kind of comes into that T stage. If it's located close to something, growing into something, that does make it a more advanced in the T stage. We also look at lymph nodes. So that's sort of, there's a, uh, an N component um, that is the number of lymph nodes. So, and where the lymph nodes are located. So if you have lymph nodes out far in the lung, that's an earlier stage. If you have lymph nodes more to the center of your chest or if you have lymph nodes elsewhere in the body, that advances the stage. And then also, cancer spread metastasis. So if it's spread somewhere outside the lung, if it's spread to the brain, if it's spread to the liver, um, that's what then increases the stages of the tumor. But we're mostly looking at size and lymph nodes, and then obviously if you have any metastatic disease. So if the size, the lymph node status, that sort of thing are amenable to a surgical resection, how do you perform these types of operations and, and what does it entail? Yeah, so the main um, standard of care for lung, early stage lung cancer, if you're able to have surgery, is called a lobectomy. So I tell patients I compare lungs to sort of an upside down tree. Uh, the trunk is like your, your windpipe. And as it comes down, it branches. It branches to the left side, it branches to the right side of your body. And then you have these clusters of leaves called lobes. So the left side has an upper and a lower lobe, and the right side has an upper, a middle, and a lower lobe. Your heart sits over to the left. That's why you end up with not having a middle lobe. So if you have a cancer in one of those lobes, we want to take out that lobe. Not the entire lung. You still have lung to breathe, but the lobe, that one cluster of leaves, because that gets rid of any lymphatics or any tissue. Um, so the surgery itself these days is definitely, that's one of those other technologies over the years that advanced. We do minimally invasive thora you know, surgery. It's called VAT surgery, video-assisted thoracic surgery. There's also um, robotic-assisted surgery as well. Um, so for me, it's, it's two incisions. You get one incision where I actually have to do my operation and take out the tumor, and that's in between the ribs. So the incision ends up being a little small incision. Then there's a smaller incision down lower on the chest where I put a camera in. Um, and we take out that surgery. Um, most people are actually surprised with how well they do. It does depend on breathing tests. So the one thing that to make sure that you are a candidate is you get some breathing tests to see how strong your lung is and then see how you'll, strong your lungs will continue to be once a lobe is taken out. Um, that then kind of determines can you have surgery and what degree of surgery you can have. There are ways that we can take less lung if we have to. Uh, ideally, we want to take the lobe. That's the best chance of preventing recurrence of cancer and your best you know, chance of cure. Um, but if we have to take less long to still hopefully get the cancer out, we base that off those breathing tests. And so with the VAT surgery, hospital stays are anywhere from, it can be a day. Uh, two days is my average in the sense of people go home. Uh, I, and I tell people expect to be out of work. Like I say plan for four weeks because you'll be surprised. It's still major surgery on the inside. Though most people will go back to work by two weeks. And I did have one patient here recently, GBMC. I operated on Monday. He went home Wednesday and he went back to work Thursday. I don't recommend that. But he just felt perfectly fine and was like, I feel fine. I feel normal. So I'm going to go back to work. I was like, okay. <laughs> Well, you're an awesome surgeon, and I, and I know that firsthand. Um, you've taken care of some of our patients and just done an amazing job with them. And it's not just lung cancer that you treat as a thoracic surgeon. So the thorax is the chest here. So what other um, disease states do you treat? What other areas of interest do you have professionally? 
So the one thing I will uh, say as a caveat I don't do is the hearts and the and the orders, the major blood vessels coming off the heart. Um, you'll see us, you know, we are, tra I am trained as a cardiothoracic surgeon. I will be show up in a computer or as a hospital as a cardiothoracic surgeon. But after training, um, delve more into just general, we call it general thoracic thoracic surgery and sense everything but that um so everything in the chest lung outside of the lungs you know outside of lung cancer I'm, i am doing treatments for infection uh sometimes people have lung disease it's not cancer that they need a diagnosis of so the pulmonary doctor can give them the right medications um there's the thymus which is a leftover remnant of fat that as a child it made our antibodies as adults it really doesn't do anything unfortunately but it grows like masses um so i do thymic cancer and and, and thymoma resections um there's the diaphragm muscles. So people have diaphragms that just aren't working right that need help. Rib cage. Esophagus is my other thing. Sorry. <laughs> That's the other thing. I spent actually a whole year training in esophagus over at uh, Pittsburgh. Um, so esophageal cancer, but also diseases of the esophagus where people just, it isn't working right. They're not swallowing right. Um, so there's a whole bunch that goes on there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, your specialty is a tough one. And if anyone didn't already gather this, this is a tough chick right here. I mean, this lady is in a very male-dominated profession. What would you say, How much, what percentage of um, females are cardiothoracic surgeons? You know, it's a lot more than it used to be for sure. Um, it, I think we're still like a third of the overall the cardiothoracic, but it's definitely gotten a lot bigger. The presence is, is, is definitely a lot more um, where I feel like Sometimes when we're at our meetings and we have like, oh, the women in thoracic surgery kind of group, you're kind of like, well, we're really starting to take over. I don't think, no, we need necessarily our own group anymore. It wasn't like, you know, 10, but when I went out, I, I came out at a good time frame where it started really increasing up. And I think the, the hardships weren't as much in training, um, but it's definitely, I find that more females are applying than ever. Um, so we're, we're, we're getting there and making it pretty much equal at this point. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, you've been all over the place. Your training, I mean, I learned a lot. I had no idea that you did all this additional fellowship like you just heard if you have an esophageal condition. She was um, at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. You were in California for a lot of it. Where are you originally from? I am originally from Baltimore, or Baltimore is the educated say is what I used to say because I didn't realize I said it differently until I went out to other states and people were like, where are you from? I'm like, Baltimore. I'm from Baltimore. And they're like, where? I'm like, Baltimore? <laughs> Um, I actually grew up uh, in Essex, uh, in Baltimore County, just outside of the city. Wow, and I know that um, congratulations are in order for you because uh, recently um, you were married, I guess that's not so recently, to someone that's also from Baltimore, is that how you say it? Um, I don't know, I'm not from here. <laughs> and, then yeah, you no. had a, <laughs> and then you had a son named James. How old is he now? He is 11 months. Yeah, no, it was funny. I was in Memphis for my first job for a couple of years and actually came back from my 20th high school reunion. We both graduated from Kenwood High School, class of 97, knew of each other, but really never hung out. Um, I came back from my high school reunion. We got to talking. He called me every day since then, and a job opportunity opened up here in Baltimore, and I, at the ripe age of 40, I was like, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta have a life outside of work. So, yep, I got married and had a baby, and James Jr. is 11 months old. Any day now is gonna uh, turn one year old and then I had him at GBMC on in December. So it's definitely flown by for sure. Oh, wow. I know. Well, I, it has flown by boy that went fast because I feel like I was just swiping your block time. Um, and I called your office and I said, when is she going to give birth? Because I want that time. So, um, no, you're, I'm so happy for you and your family and all of that sort of thing. So, um, you came back to this area and there's obviously a lot of choices in Baltimore. There's a lot of hospitals. So what made you come back and, um, set up shop at GBMC? Why, why this hospital? You know, I think that in training, I've obviously experienced the bigger hospitals. You know, I know what it's like to be at those bigger hospitals. Um, and they're definitely all amazing hospitals in that sense. But what I like about GBMC, um, you know, it is still its own entity of a hospital. It's not GBMC part of this this Star Health and, and, and this other division. Um, I find, and especially with the cancer center here that I'm involved with and in our oncology tumor boards, you get a lot more individualized attention. Um, and, I, and I'm also speaking from personal stuff with my son. I've had some things where other hospitals, I've had issues getting a hold of the office, or I, I know my son's more of a number of a case in a sense. Here, it is a smaller hospital, but there are some, in a smaller amount of patients, you're still gonna get the excellent care that you would get. And if we don't have the excellent care, we're gonna send you to the excellent care. You know, like we're not gonna hold on to you and say, oh, we have old age technology. 
but we're going to hold on to you because we don't want to give it up. No, we're going to do what's best for the patient. And I see that very clearly, even through my radiation oncologist, my oncologist, if they don't know, or they're, you know, there's something extra challenging, we're going to reach out to someone else and ask a question. But I like the individual attention that patients get. And I think, you know, when we talk about tumor boards, we're, we're addressing that patient, that patient's cancer and what's going to be best for them, not the number statistic or, Hey, this patient has this stage, he's going to get this chemo, he's going to get this. It's, you know, this individual patient. So I do think it's definitely, if there's one thing I can comment, uh, one of my previous partners that I worked with in Memphis, actually my attending through like almost all my training, I was talking to him recently and he actually kind of commented like, in all the years I've known you, this is the happiest that you've sounded. So clearly stuff's going right in Baltimore in the sense that you're working at a great institution where people really care about the patients. They care about you, you know, it's, it's very well rounded, hospital in that sense. Um, so that's kind of what I've really liked about working here. I mean, that's awesome. And you brought up something um, interesting that I don't think a lot of people realize. You said tumor board. So tumor boards are so fascinating to me, especially the one here at GBMC. Like you said, it's, it is still state-of-the-art um, uh, clinicians and technology and people coming together and discussing a case. So what, uh, what exactly, tell me more details about how that works. You said that you'll put a case up there and then, and then what happens with that case? So um, we basically, you have a patient, so any patient I see, even if it's the early stage and all they need is surgery, um, I present with these students where we go, we, we go over, we have everyone there. So our radiologist who goes through all the images and, and, you know, helps us point out, like if some read said something and we were like, we didn't really see it. They're like, oh, this right here. And so we all look at the images. And when I say, oh, it's radiology, radiation oncology, because they're the ones that if you're going to get radiation therapy, we're going to give radiation therapy. The medical oncologists are the ones that are responsible for immunotherapies and chemotherapies. I'm the surgical oncologist uh, for thoracic surgery, so I'm at that tumor board, um, as well as we've got um, uh, genetics. You know, we have other, part, you know, because there's always multi-factors. There's also social aspects and genetics and nutrition. You know, everyone's sort of involved in talking about the patient. And we look at the cases, we go over the pathology results, we also are able to kind of give our own individual input, like, okay, I've seen this, you know, and pulmonology as well, sorry, the med they're what I call the medical lung doctors. They don't do the surgeries, but, and they do do some biopsies, but they give like medicines, but they get a lot of patients with the lung nodules um, that they'll see first. And sometimes it's just a matter of plopping up an image going, what do you think of this? And and, I, and it's me saying, well, I, I agree with you. I think that looks, despite the read, I think this does look like cancer. I think we should be concerned. So it's a lot of you know, individualized on that patient, that scan, and then we follow up after they've gotten treatment. We look at the scans, we look at, you know, what are the great results. If I've operated, I go over the pathology. Is surgery enough or is this the patient that might need chemotherapy after surgery? And what should we follow up? Should we follow up in three months, six months, you know? So it's everyone getting together and really talking about the patients. It, it's a great collaboration, especially the one at GBMC. That, that is remarkable. And I think that's what gives the results and the outcomes as, as great as they are, while still giving it that personal touch and that community feel um, you're getting this amazing care, which is fantastic. Speaking of amazing care, we have a shout out to you. Um, we are live on Facebook. So um, Ari Elman says, we are missing you at Thoracic Tumor Board. I am board. missing the tumor board right now. <laughs> um, you're I'm supposed to be there. Speaking of the tumor board, we're missing you there. And by the way, Dr. Sullivan is the best surgeon. And I mean, <laughs> duh, she is exceptional. That's why um, we're interviewing her. I'm sorry to take her away from that, but she'll be catching up very soon on that uh, front. So that just shows you. Um, yeah. They <laughs> they well, love you here. It's great. The tumor board instead of Facebook. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Why are you on Facebook? What are you doing? Um, get back to the patients and helping to collaborate for their care. Come on now. Um, well, this is uh, fantastic. So let's say we have a patient out there who has a thoracic issue, an esophageal issue, a thymus um, type issue. They just need a thoracic surgeon. How do they get started with you and your practice? Well, it's sort of, you know, first it's obviously making sure you, you know, you have, because usually your primary care is noticed, or if you don't have a primary care and you, you think you meet those lung cancer screening uh, criteria, for sure, just give my office a call. I don't know if that's something that pops up on the screen because I'm not the best at remembering self numbers in these days and age. Um, but it's certainly easy to call my office. I have two great workers in my office, Diana and Alex, who are so amazing with patients and easily to get you scheduled. And if not, help you figure out am I the right person? Because we do sometimes get calls for things that I don't treat. And we say, okay, I don't do this, but I can refer you to someone that does. 
um, on that. Got you. So um, that is fantastic that um, if y your PCP can get you started with your office and is the best number to call, go ahead and tell us, 443? Uh, I'll look it up. I was going to say it's in my cell what I, Oh, what I have um, here is, oh, is that the 34 number? Is that your cell phone or is this the, here we go. This is the best number to call. It is 443-849-3470. <laughs> is that on it? That is definitely the that's definitely the office number. That is definitely it. Okay, my friends, look down here. This is where you need to be. It is 443-849-3470. And Dr. Sullivan can help you with any of these thoracic issues that you might have. And remember, it is November. It is Lung Cancer Awareness Month, the number one killer of um, any type of cancer in both men and women. It is a significant thing. And um, you should get screened if you reach those appropriate screening markers she talked about in the beginning. And just take care of yourself. I know that a lot of times with COVID, some things have fallen by the wayside, but um, that your health shouldn't be one of them. That's that's definitely for sure. So here we go. So Dr. Sullivan, thank you so much for being here today for um, sharing your information. I learned a lot. I forgot about the thymus stuff. I have to admit, I'm like, oh yeah, I, I did learn a lot about that. So forgot about that whole part of your disease state that you treat. So that was interesting, but, but thank you again for being here. Thank you. It was fun. <laughs> Awesome. So again, if you want to get started with her, just call the office. You can also go to gbmc.org and you can look for thoracic surgery. You can look specifically for a find a physician and that is Dr. Jennifer Sullivan. She is the division chief of thoracic surgery here at GBMC. She is a remarkably talented surgeon um, and a fantastic clinician and just an all around kind, wonderful, empathetic person. So thank you again for watching and uh, we're going to sign off here. I hope that you have a great night. It is a rainy one here in Baltimore, but we'll see you next time. So that was What's Up, Dr. Dobek. Thanks again.